it's been called one of the greatest movies ever made. We're all busy little bees, full of stings, making honey day and night. Aren't we, honey? It's been praised as having one of the finest screenplays ever written. Why do they always look like unhappy rabbits? Because that's what they are. I don't make him happy. But the heated performances and scorching screenplay... You can always put that award where your heart ought to be. ...were nothing compared to the passionate fireworks that exploded behind the scenes. What's attractive on stage need not necessarily be attractive off. All right. High art, low blows, and the demons of desire. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. On Backstory, all about Eve. As it happens, there are particular aspects of my life to which I would like to maintain sole and exclusive rights and privileges. For instance, what? For instance, you. Joseph Mankiewicz's All About Eve was that rare animal in Hollywood. It was a true work of art in which every element blended perfectly. It had a brilliant script filled with biting humor. What'll you have? A milkshake. A stellar cast that showcased some of Hollywood's finest actors at the very peaks of their careers. And it had a director who brought out the very best work from everyone involved. You take charge. I believe I will. But what made the film a smash hit was its star, Betty Davis, who salvaged her fading career with a tour de force performance that uncannily mirrored her off-screen life. It was the greatest break at that point in my career that ever happened. There's no question about it. As I told Mankiewicz, he resurrected me from the dead. Glory, hallelujah. In 1949, Joseph Mankiewicz was Hollywood's golden boy. The multi-talented filmmaker had just won Oscars for both writing and directing A Letter to Three Wives, a film that further revealed his fascination with exploring the female psyche. In all of his films, the films that he wrote, and especially the ones that he wrote and directed, the women are the best parts. They have the best parts. They are the most three-dimensional characters and the most fascinating characters. Actresses in, in particular fascinated him. Mankiewicz had always dreamed of making a movie about the theater world, but it took a short story from Cosmopolitan magazine to make that dream a reality. Based on a true story, The Wisdom of Eve was the tale of a conniving young actress who latches on to a great but fading star who's reached the critical age of 40. I remember him commenting how unfair it was that women uh, were considered no longer uh, beautiful or able to hold on to a carry a star role, romantic role, sometime north of 40. Ingenues keep coming up beneath you and you keep moving on. Mankiewicz developed the story into a treatment for a film entitled Best Performance. 20th Century Fox studio chief Daryl F. Zanuck liked the idea so much that he agreed to make it one of his personal productions. Zanuck was very enthusiastic, and when Zanuck got the script, he'd go through and make notations, and there was a line near the beginning of the script where it said, but uh, more about Eve later. In fact, all about Eve. And Zanuck circled that, and that may have been the first time that the thoughts were given to using that as the title. But almost immediately, Mankiewicz and his brilliant but volatile producer began arguing over casting. For the duplicitous Eve, Zanuck wanted to hire Gene Crane, but Mankiewicz insisted on another Fox contract player, 26-year-old Oscar winner Ann Baxter. Oh, Ann Baxter, Hello, good to see Ann. you. How are you? I haven't seen you since the Academy Awards. Congratulations on winning that Oscar. Thanks, Ed, very much. Mankiewicz believed strongly that in contrast to Gene Crane, Ann Baxter had what it took to play the part, something he called bitch virtuosity. I know Eve better than anyone. She wanted success. She had her own ideas on how to get it. She lied, she cheated, she forgot moral scruples, and when necessary, she even walked in and out of her friends' hearts without knocking. To play the critical role of Karen Richards, the woman who unwittingly aids Eve in her ruthless climb to stardom, Mankiewicz chose another Oscar winner, Celeste Holm. But Holm had recently left Fox following a bitter contract dispute with Daryl Zanuck. Mankiewicz said, I'd like you to play Karen. In fact, I don't want to make the movie unless you do. 
Um, Susanna had to hire me back. Yeah, 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 yeah. And <laughs> but that's a, you know, that was a nice moment. But the most difficult decision of all was the casting of the central character, Margot Channing, the flamboyant but insecure stage star. Producer and director considered many of Hollywood's top actresses before they finally agreed. 46-year-old Claudette Colbert would play the coveted role. But then, just two weeks before filming began, all of Zanuck and Mankiewicz's careful planning was derailed by a plot twist worthy of a backstage melodrama. Claudette Colbert ruptured her disc when she was making a scene in Three Came Home, and she was put in traction for a long time. So the panic set in. Desperate for a replacement, Zanuck and Mankiewicz finally turned to the only other available actress who had the kind of experience and star quality that the part demanded. Betty Davis. Zanuck is impatient. He wants me. He needs Zanuck, me. Zanuck, 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 what are you two lovers? The outspoken and fiery actress had been the reigning queen of Warner Brothers Studios and the winner of two Best Actress Oscars. She had given indelible performances in such landmark films as Jezebel, The Little Foxes, and Now Voyager. But by 1950, Davis's career was starting to resemble a black hole. She had made a series of box office flops and found herself no longer in demand. After an infamous battle with Jack Warner, Davis parted ways with the studio that had been her home for 18 years. So people thought, well, that's the end of Betty Davis, and she indeed was no spring chicken. She thought she was through, did you know that? 41 years old, marvelous. But for the creators of All About Eve, Betty Davis seemed to offer the best and only hope of saving their troubled production. There was only one problem. Zanuck and Davis couldn't stand each other. In fact, the two hadn't been on speaking terms ever since Davis walked out from her post as president of the Motion Picture Academy in 1941. Zanuck had said, she'll never work in this town again. But that was the last time that they'd had any kind of a meeting, apparently. Swallowing his pride, Zanuck phoned the star at home. Betty picked up the phone and the voice on the other end said, Betty, this is Daryl. She said, Daryl who? Daryl Zanuck, of course. And she said, all right, all right, whoever you are, come off it. But Davis soon realized that the man on the phone was not a prankster. Daryl Zanuck was offering her what sounded like the role of a lifetime. After reading Joe Mankiewicz's script, she was sure of it. She was absolutely thrilled. Betty Davis was very shrewd, and when she saw something that was good, she respected that. But in this case, as soon as she read that script, she knew that we're talking about quality here. And of course, it was a perfect casting. The aging actress had agreed to play an aging actress. In fact, it was hard to miss the frequent parallels in the script between the career of Betty Davis and that of her fictional counterpart, Margot Channing. But once the camera started to roll, Fiction and fact would converge in ways that no one would have thought possible. With just days to go before shooting began on All About Eve, Betty Davis's co-stars began to speculate about what it would be like to work with the notoriously temperamental actress. We were taking a plane up to San Francisco. It was a hydroplane, very noisy, with Hugh Marlowe and Gary Merrill. So I hollered over the noise, what do you think it's going to be like working with the queen bee? And Gary hollered back, well, I know one thing, it'll all be over in eight weeks. Even a seasoned veteran like director Joseph Mankiewicz was anxious about working with the legendary star. Edmund Goulding called me and said, dear boy, uh, you're out of your mind. This woman will annihilate you. She will grind you to a fine powder and blow you away. She will come on the set with a large yellow pad and sharp pencils, and she will write. And having written, she will then direct. Just when exactly does an actress decide they're her words she's saying and her thoughts she's expressing? Usually at the point when she has to rewrite and rethink them to keep the audience from leaving the theater. But this time, it was different. Davis knew better than to change Mankiewicz's flawless script. And to the director's surprise, she turned out to be one of the most agreeable leading ladies he'd ever worked with. 
all her other scripts, her handwriting was on every single page. On the script of Eve, there were no notations. She said, what did I need to do? This genius had done it all. Through fate and circumstance, Mankiewicz had discovered the perfect marriage of actress and character. Mankiewicz said, now here's the key to the character. Margot treats a mink coat like a poncho. Where's my coat? Right where you left it. Oh. And Betty Davis said that this made all the sense in the world. She could do whatever she wanted. She was the star. When shooting began in San Francisco on April 11th, 1950, the director was astounded as he watched Betty Davis become Margot Channing before the cameras. Or was it just Betty Davis being Betty Davis? Sometimes it was hard to tell the difference. People waiting around night after night just to see you, even in the wind and the rain. Autograph fiends, they're not people. Those little beasts that run around in packs like coyotes. They're your fans, your audience. They're nobody's fans. They're juvenile delinquents. They're mental defectives. They're nobody's audience. They never see a play or a movie even. They never indoors long enough. The first time I ever went into a Betty Davis dressing room, I opened the door of the dressing room, and there was Margot, and the tapes on her hair, masses of cold cream on her face. And she had a large scotch there, and she was yelling about this and yelling about that. And I mean, that's pure Betty Davis. Hollywood's grandest dame had no trouble identifying with Margot's brassy self-confidence or with her professional anxiety about reaching the age of 40. 40, 4 oh. But Betty and Margot also shared another, much more personal bond. And in the last analysis, nothing's any good unless you can look up just before dinner or turn around in bed. And there he is. Without that, you're not a woman. You're something with a French provincial office or a, a book full of clippings. Like the character she was playing on screen, Betty Davis craved a happy family life away from the spotlight. The actress was in the middle of a bitter divorce from her third husband, artist William Sherry, and she was frustrated that the men in her life seemed unwilling to share the spotlight with her. She said that the trouble was that they all hated being Mr. Davis. And she said, what could I do about it? But the moment she laid eyes on her new on-screen love interest, 34-year-old Gary Merrill, she realized that she and Margot shared something else very important in common, their taste in men. The biggest bonus of all was seeing this very good-looking man, a uh, very hairy man, as she used to say, that she loved hairy men. And she saw this hairy man coming towards her and said, my God. And she fell right in love with Bill Sampson. There was chemistry going there. This was a hot and heavy relationship that was going on, which of course did nothing but improve the aspect as represented in the film. <laughs> Heaven help me. I love a psychotic. Davis and Merrill seemed like the perfect couple, except for the fact that both were already married. Dad always used to say, I don't care when the bell rings at the end of the day, if members of my cast go out and make love to a McCormick Reaper, get drunk, whatever they do, so long as the next morning they're on time and ready to give it 100%. The production team moved back to the Fox sound stages in Los Angeles, where they shot the infamous party scene, in which all of the characters and their secret agendas collide in one cocktail-drenched confrontation. We know you. We've seen you like this before. Is it over or is it just beginning? Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. The party also marked the first appearance of an attractive blonde whom Zanuck had fired from the studio two years earlier for being unphotogenic, Marilyn Monroe. You see that man? That's Max Fabian, the producer. Now go and do yourself some good. Why do they always look like unhappy rabbits? Because that's what they are. Now go and make him happy. Marilyn played a young starlet intent on advancing her career by befriending powerful men, offering yet another example of art imitating life. I don't want to make trouble. All I want is a drink. Leave it to me. 
I'll get you one. Thank you, Mr. Fabian. Well done. I can see your career rising in the east like the sun. Veteran cynic George Sanders also made a grand entrance at the party as critic Addison DeWitt, the character closest to Mankiewicz's heart. We're a breed apart from the rest of humanity, we theater folk. We are the original displaced personalities. You won't have to read his column tomorrow, Eve. You just heard it. I don't agree, Addison. That happens to be your particular abnormality. All of Dad's venom, uh, disdain, uh, and I use the words uh, uh, nicely, uh, he saved for Addison DeWitt. There's so many of Addison's observations that I can hear my father saying. There was a lot of Addison DeWitt in him. With its air of urban sophistication and backstage backstabbing, it was only a matter of time before rumors began to fly that the actors filming All About Eve were as contentious off-screen as they were on. But according to the film's cast members, rumors of catty behavior behind the scenes just weren't true. Yeah, you were supposed to uh, be at one another's throats and cut the atmosphere with a knife and that sort of thing. There was nothing like that. There was no cattiness on the set at all. Do you think Joseph Ankowitz would have stood still for any kind of behavior of that kind? No. Even though there was an absence of obvious hostility on the set, there was a famous and frosty feud between Betty Davis and co-star Celeste Holm. I walk onto the set, and there's Betty, and I say, good morning. And she said, oh, shit, good manners. And I felt as if I'd been hit in the face with a wet flounder. And I never spoke to her again. She called me a bitch. OK. Oh, relax, kid. It's just me and my big mouth. It's just that you get me so mad sometimes. But Holm got the last laugh while filming the scene in which her character realizes that Eve's master plan has backfired. I don't want to play Cora. What? Now, wait a minute. You're always so touchy about his plays. It isn't a part. It's a great part and a fine play. But not for me anymore. Not for a four-square, upright, downright, forthright married lady. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> Nothing. Everything. Everything's so funny. <laughs> Davis was startled by Holmes' ability to laugh on command. She said, I can't do that. And I said, oh, I'm sure you could if you tried. And she said, no, I can't. And at that point, Mackowitz said, would you like to do it again? And I said, sure. So <laughs> off I went. And uh, it was then that I realized that Joe had been aware of how difficult Betty had been to me. You know what I'm going to be? Cowboy? A married lady. With a paper to prove it. No more make-believe, off stage or on. By the end of filming, Betty Davis had made the same decision as Margot Channing. She would marry her younger leading man. But unlike Margot, she was not ready to give up show business. Not when she had just turned in the kind of performance that would make Hollywood sit up and take notice. All About Eve was about to put a gifted actress back in the spotlight. But could she handle the glare? Betty Davis was about to find out. Eve has insatiable ambition and talent. An improbable person with a contempt for humanity, an inability to love or be loved. But how can such a woman fool so many? Well, how does any Eve do it? Guided by the sure hand of writer-director Joseph Mankiewicz, the shooting of All About Eve was completed in mid-June 1950. On July 28th, Betty Davis and Gary Merrill were married in Mexico, just hours after Merrill's divorce was final. And on October 13th that same year, the world got to meet Margot Channing and her acid-tongued colleagues for the first time. Hollywood's fabulous Chinese theater is the distinguished setting for the gala West Coast premiere of the latest 20th century Fox dramatic masterpiece, All About Eve, getting a novel salute from the neighboring Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel as the film's producer, Daryl F. Zanuck, and his wife lead a host of celebrities, including the picture's writer-director, Joseph Mankiewicz, to the opening. Hailed for her performance in All About Eve, Betty Davis attends with her mother, while title role player Ann Baxter brings hubby John Hodiak. Next day, Betty Davis, with a Marine escort, returns to the scene of triumph 
to be immortalized in the Chinese theater's famous cement. A tribute to her outstanding performance in All About Eve, a performance the public is now hailing as one of the finest of her career. All About Eve was an immediate hit, and soon the film and its cast and crew began reaping award after award. But a fierce battle was raging in 20th Century Fox over Oscar nominations. Anne Baxter wanted the studio to nominate her as Best Actress instead of Best Supporting Actress, a move that would put her in direct competition with Betty Davis. It was yet another in a series of examples of how scenes from the film would resonate in the star's real lives. In February 1951, for the first time in history, two leading ladies from the same film were on the ballot together. All About Eve was nominated for a record-breaking 14 Oscars, including Best Picture, Best Director, and Best Screenplay. It was a staggering number of nominations. It still holds the record, tied with Titanic, for the most number of nominations in motion picture history. And when one looks at a huge, sprawling film like Titanic, and then thinks that in All About Eve, probably the biggest piece of action is Betty Davis walking down a staircase, it's even more remarkable. The triumphant Betty Davis knew she had delivered the performance of her career and felt certain that she had earned her third Oscar. As the winner was announced, she, along with Ann Baxter and Sunset Boulevard's Gloria Swanson, leaned forward, only to hear that the year's Best Actress Academy Award would go to Judy Holliday for her performance in Born Yesterday. Davis was devastated. Well, the Fox are to blame. They should have persuaded Baxter to go into Best Supporting Actress, and that Betty and Gloria were sort of neck and neck, so it splits and it goes to the underdog. Life seemed determined to imitate art one last time, as the actress who played Betty's arch enemy inadvertently ruined her chances of winning an Oscar. Ann Baxter admitted she should have accepted the Best Supporting Actress nomination. Davis, in her typical style, said, yes, she should have. I'm happy to announce that the winner is All About Eve. But regardless of the disappointments, All About Eve swept up six Oscars, including Best Picture and Best Score. Mankiewicz won another two Oscars for both directing and writing, and George Sanders picked up the award for the year's Best Supporting Actor. Despite her Oscar disappointment, Betty Davis had made a spectacular comeback and would forever be identified with the great Margot Channing. Unfortunately, her marriage to Gary Merrill was less enduring. The couple divorced after 10 years. In a way, that should have worked, except she said to me, you know, that something peculiar happened, that he, he married Margot Channing, not Betty Davis, and she married Bill Sampson, not Gary Merrill. But whatever regrets Betty Davis may have had about her backstage romance, no one could deny that All About Eve re-established her as one of Hollywood's greatest stars and established Margot Channing as one of the most memorable characters in the history of cinema. Slow curtain, the end. 